長い年月を経て赤き月の影は再びこの星を覆う思い出したかレイン世の命はそなたのためにありそなたを悲しませる存在は世が全て排除する人間が我々に支配される今日思い出した Hey everyone, this is Nitro. In this video, I am going to be talking about the way to build Shilinka. So, Shilinka is the new hero that will be released tomorrow on July 2nd. One of the two new heroes, the other being Elusia. And Shilinka seems to be the more interesting hero of the two, but she does have some major weaknesses, which I'll go over. In this video,、uh, especially during the coverage of Apex Arena example battles. So let's start by covering Shilinka's stats. Okay, first of all, Shilinka is part of the Meteor faction, which is buffed by z e r i d a and part of g i z a r o t h s Mythical Realm faction. So there's only two faction buffers for Shilinka, so that's important to know because. If both faction buffers are banned, you're going to need another way to get her increased attack, like strengthen or gospel or something similar.、Okay. Her talent is Eternal Solitude, and it has several effects. First, at the end of her action, if there are no allies within two spaces of her, her damage dealt is increased by a certain percentage. Let's just say 20%. And her damage received will also be decreased. By the same percentage, 20%. And these buffs both last one turn. Secondly, if Shilinka is not currently under the rest status, then this unit will not die when taking fatal damage. And instead, she will recover 90% of her hit points and enter the rest state.、Okay. In the rest state, she cannot act and she recovers a certain percentage of hit points at the end of the effect.、Okay. And this effect lasts. Three, two, or one turn.、Yeah. So, because of this second effect, she, in order to really use Shalinka, she really needs to be six stars, right? Having a two turn revival effect or just a simple one turn revival is an absolutely huge difference. So, if you don't have a six star Shalinka, she's very much not worth using, in my opinion. A two turn revival is still really, really iffy, but the one turn revival will make it very easy for her to come back to life.、Okay. In addition, you know. She re- when she dies for the first time, she recovers 90% hit points. And when she comes out of the rest state, she recovers another 50%. So if the enemy can't kill her when she's at 90% hit points, she is going to pretty much come back to life at full health. And of course, it's important to note that this rest state can only activate once per battle. So if she has rested one time, the second time she gets killed, she will die. But nonetheless, the fact that she can revive at least one time makes her very, very annoying to fight against.、Okay. In terms of bond requirements, for her fourth bond, she needs Brenda, and for her fifth bond, she needs Rainforce. So if you don't have Brenda and Rainforce, you really don't particularly want to use Shalinka. You know? And finally, her max stats、um, her two classes are Sword Saint and Wings of Destruction. Okay. Sword Saint is an infantry class, and Wings of Destruction, I didn't write it down, but it's an archer class.、Okay. So, Sword Saint, not too much needs to be said about that. Good hit points, much higher attack, 595 attack, and、uh, higher defense as well, at 295 defense.、Okay. Magic defense is naturally lower for this infantry class, but this infantry class also has very high skill at 253. So, you know, the Sword Saint class is tankier with higher attack value. The Wings of Destruction class, obviously, less hit points, much less attack, 537 as compared to 595, and 32 less defense.、Okay. It does have my higher magic defense, but that's not a huge factor, in my opinion. Finally, Shalinka's Soldier Boost is 25% hit points to soldiers, 35% to attack. 25% to defense and 15% to magic defense. So it's kind of split up,、um, but ultimately, it, since it increases both hit points for a decent amount and defense for a, certain, for a decent amount, it means that Shilinka is pretty tanky against physical strikes. Okay? And she, of course, she has 35% attack, which is very close to the maximum 40%. So she's, a good, she's 
ultimately she's an offensively oriented character, but she can tank physical strikes, or potentially tank physical strikes. Alright, so next let's talk about Shalinka's Heart Bond and the effect of it. Okay, In the Sword Saint class, the level 4 bond will have the following effect. When battling with units with hit points lower than this unit, damage taken is decreased by 10% when entering battle. Keep in mind that these heart bond effects only apply to the so to the hero themselves, it does not apply to the soldiers. Okay. The level 7 effect is when melee attacked and entering battle, damage dealt is increased by 10. And the level 10 effect is all hero stats plus 5%. As for Wings of Destruction, at the level 4 bond will be when unit hit points is less than 70%, Damage taken is reduced by 10% when entering battle. This one is effectively useless because if her soldier hit point is below 70%, she's going to die to any physical strike or any magic strike. So effectively, that 10% damage will not save you. Okay. The level 7 effect is when ranged attack and entering battle, damage dealt is increased by 10%. And the level 10 effect, as always, is all hero stats increased by 5%. So none of these, bo none of these heart bond effects are very good, right? Because... Doing extra damage when being attacked is not a huge deal, and having, and ultimately the reduced damage effects, you know, whatever. At the end of the day, right? Uh, um, of note though, the Sword Saint level four bond does have a use if you bring one of her skills, which I'll mention later. Okay, it will kick in consistently if you bring one of those skills. But ultimately, once again, I don't think it's a big impact on whether she survives or not. So let's move on. So now let's talk about her useful skills, okay? And the first three skills is really her PvP combo, okay? You're gonna bring her Awakening skill, the 3C Awakening skill, Chill of Bloodthirst, okay? It's a two range skill that attacks a single enemy dealing 1.6 times damage at two range. In addition to that, melee soldiers can also attack with this skill. And after combat, you recover 30% of damage dealt as hit points. Finally, for every enemy unit adjacent to the target, you ignore 20% of the target's defense for a maximum of 40% defense reduction. And finally, if the target has no enemy units within two spaces, then after defeating an enemy unit, you may act again. And this effect cannot activate multiple times in one turn. So, you know, if you have a clocks Shalinka, you can't keep using this skill and keep acting again. Not that you should be building clocks on Shalinka in the first place, but, you know, they're preventing that potential, you know, overpowered issue. So, important thing to note about her 3C skill is it doesn't really apply any debuffs on the enemies, first of all. And secondly, it is, it can be guarded against by any tank. But because it can ignore a large amount of the enemy's defense, it does make a pretty good tank buster. And finally, if you do manage to attack an enemy that's completely isolated, you're allowed to act again, which can be a big bonus or big advantage. Okay. So that's Chill of Bloodthirst. Okay. The second skill that you really should bring, and this, this would be the one point skill to combine with the three cost awakening skill, and the skill is Flash. The passive effect of it is that when you're using ranged soldiers, your unit's movement type is considered flying. Okay. When you use it actively, it's an assist skill. It's a self-buffing skill. Okay. Active use where when you use it, you instantly move to a chosen space and gain plus movement plus two. Okay. So it's a basically a self-teleport skill. You teleport yourself forward to a certain tile, and once you've teleported to a certain tile, you get movement plus two. You also gain a buff, another buff, final effort, where before entering combat, if there is at least one enemy unit adjacent to the target, then this attack will hit the enemy hero directly. So kind of like, you know, Zerda with her Bloodthirster plus Killing Blow combo, you will just directly strike the enemy hero, which makes it very easy for her to potentially one-shot enemy targets. So the enemy has to keep characters spread out, right? They, if, they decide to place characters adjacent to each other, Flash will guarantee Shalinka one-shots an enemy. So this is going to be a quick demonstration of the way Flash works. The skill is activated, and then you can see that Shalinka teleports herself forward. And finally, 
you get to see that she applies a plus 2 mobility buff on herself. It's important to note that it will not stack with a breeze buff. Finally, her third skill that you bring would be Dream Breaker, which is a standard ignore guard skill. Right? It attacks a single enemy, dealing 1.4 times damage. So 1.4 times is slightly more than the usual 1.3 times damage of ignore guard skills. The difference with Dream Breaker is that first of all, melee soldiers will also attack with this skill, so you can attack at 2 range or 1 range, and if there are no allied units within 3 spaces of this unit, this attack will ignore guard. And when defeating an enemy, you may move 2 spaces after the battle. So very very nice skill, right? Uh, even if What this skill means is, even if you don't have Zerida's Meteor Faction buff, you can attack and retreat after using Dream Breaker. 2 tiles generally isn't enough to escape from the enemy, but it might be enough for you to get Shilinka into the guard range of one of your tanks or whatever. The last two skills I have highlighted as useful is Air Slash and Snipe, and the main reason these two skills are useful is because they have low cooldown. Cooldown of 2, right? Dreambreaker has a cooldown of 3, Chill of Bloodthirst has a cooldown of 5, so you might choose to use Air Slash and Snipe for doing PvE content. But Dreambreaker, Flash, and Chill of Bloodthirst is her most common combo for PvP. Okay. Finally, let's talk about her other skills that she has access to. Okay. I have these skills listed in the other skills section, but I should mention that Mirror Flower is potentially useful. Okay. Most of these I would say are the useless skills for her, because they're all the one, po one point cost skills. But, uh, and generally speaking, you would want to bring Flash. But she does have Mirror Flower as well. And Mirror Flower is another passive where when using melee soldiers, unit's movement is considered flying. Okay. When being attacked and entering combat, enemy unit will deal one times fixed damage to itself. Okay. And the damage is equal to the enemy series attack and int added together multiplied by one. In addition to that, Shilinka will recover hit points equals to the amount of damage the enemy dealt to themselves. And finally, if Shilinka is in a rest state, the effects of this is doubled. So it will do two times damage to the enemy. And Shilinka will receive two times the attack and int of the enemy hero in healing. So not too much needs to be said about that skill, right? I mean, it's pretty straightforward as an explanation. It's hard to say that it's worth replacing Flash to bring it, right? The Mirror Flower. But it could be considered, you know, in certain circumstances. The other skills like Strengthen, a self buff of a self attack and int increase buff, you know, if you have no faction buffer at all, you might be forced to bring Strengthen on Shalika instead of Flash, for example. You know, defense break, I would say there's almost no situations where you should really be bringing defense break. And deathmatch increases her own attack and skill at the cost of defense and magic defense. Once again, I just don't see you fitting that one point skill in over flash or mirror flower. So next, let's talk about the materials that you need to do the awakening battles for Shilinka. Right? So you need 8 life crystals and 8 barrier crystals for the first awakening. And for the second awakening, you need 12 pure monsoon hearts and 12 pure molten hearts. Of course, you need the 5 splendid stardust and 5 eternal moon splendors, which is pretty normal for every single hero. If you don't have those, then you won't be able to do the awakenings at all. But generally speaking, you should be you know, auto-battling the eternal temple and bonding realm battles every single day to get these materials. Let's move on to talk about Shilinka's soldiers. So Shilinka has access to seven soldiers. Of those seven, I would say four of them are arguably use useful ones, but um, ultimately it also kind of depends on which soldiers you have leveled up, okay? So because Shilinka has those skills that can make her flying, like Flash for example, since she as long as she's bringing ranged characters, she will be flying with Flash. Overall, her best archer soldier ends up being Firebrand Snipers as a result. Because Firebrand Snipers have the attack increase of 30% when attacking. And after battle, they also deal 15% of the enemy's max hit points as fixed damage. Okay. Sky Archers also makes the character flying. And 
in the case of Sky Archers, they also have a 30% attack increase, right? But they don't have that fixed damage effect. So that's why Sky Archers aren't considered as good. The High Elves are very generic. I, I've said it before, I don't recommend anyone levels them. So overall, you know, for Archers, and then the Bandits have only 15% attack increase. They also get 15% crit chance increase, but overall, a 30% attack increase would be superior. So that's why Firebrand Snipers are her best ranged soldier. Other than her ranged soldiers, she has access to two infantry style soldiers and one demon soldier. So the two infantry soldiers are heavy infantry and cyborg, while her demon soldier is skeleton knight. One interesting thing to note is the cyborgs are actually able to participate in ranged attacks because their unique effect is when attacking, you can fight with the hero's long range attack and troop damage increases by 30%. However, keep in mind that cyborgs toss out those torches when they attack with their attack animation and very often the hero's attack will land on the same targets as the cyborg torches so you're going to lose damage that way like like how Sonya when she attacks with melee soldiers at two range with chaos helix she will do less damage than when she melee attacks you'll suffer the same problem if you use cyborgs at 2 range. That's just something to keep in mind with regards to using cyborgs, but she does have access to them, right? And having a troop damage increase of 30% can be useful even if you use them for melee strikes, okay? So other than cyborgs, she has access to heavy infantry, and the heavy infantry special is that when attacking, soldiers attack increases by 30%. When attacked, Soldier's defense increases by 30%. So they're both offensively powerful as well as defensively powerful. So heavy infantry make a great soldier choice for her if you're not running into cavalry style enemies. Okay. And finally, her last soldier choice is the Skeleton Knights Demon class. No, they have two effects. The first one is when troop hit points is at 0% and when attacking, troops recover 50% of their hit points after battle. And the second effect is when attacked other than by holy and demon enemies, defense is increased by 30%. So the Skeleton Knights are surprisingly tanky soldiers. Um, they can absorb a lot of damage because of that second effect in particular. And yeah, so which soldier you use will very much depend on the situation. You know, I'll have, I have various examples coming up which will show her using these different soldiers in action, all right? But I would say overall, I would say the best soldiers for her, for Shalinka would be Firebrand Snipers as the ranged soldier. For melee combat, I would generally say you choose, you choose between heavy infantry and skeleton knights depending on the enemies that you're facing, you know? Cyborgs, I generally don't recommend as a soldier, but you may choose to bring them if you have them at level 10, right? And you don't have heavy infantry at level 10. So at this point, I am going to start talking about the best gear for Shalinka, right? Now, keep in mind that because Shalinka can be both infantry and archer class, I actually have separated her best gear into the two pages, depending on which class you use her in. I would generally say my personal preference for Shalinka would be that you use her in infantry class, but she can be used in her archer class as well. Although her targeting ability, her ability to one-shot enemies will change in that kind of situation. So for infantry class, the main reason to use her in infantry class is simply because the infantry class can equip apex boots. So that by itself will increase her base movement to four instead of three. So, and then at four movement, adding two movement after having teleported forward, she has a total of six movement and potentially two range. So that's why infantry class is generally considered superior. And in the first place, the infantry class has more attack, right? So her best gear will generally be seal maximum attack value, right? So seal guardian, Aeolus's battle armor, Theory of Tear for increased damage and Apex Boots for the attack increase and mobility increase. Secondary gear would be to change the Seal Guardian for a Frost Rend, to replace the Aeolus' Battle Armor with Bloodline Magic Armor. The Vampire Mask is a huge 
decrease compared to the Fury of Tear, but it is usable, okay? So the secondary gear is not as recommended, right? But it is a viable set. Okay. And as for other gear, other gear is completely not recommended. This is a set of gear where if you have nothing else to use, you might choose to use this set. And this set would be about pretty much increasing hit points and defense as much as possible. So the weapon is Frostrend rather than Seal Guardian because you get Frostrend very early on. So there should be no reason for you not to have a sword built, right? Uh, or a Frostrend built, I should say. Aeneas' armor and Aeneas' helmet are both free items that you can get while leveling up. And same with the Wing Shin Guards. So this offers a, this is like an early build Shalinka. But once again, my general opinion is if you don't have Apex Boots, you should not even be using Shalinka in the first place. Okay. So that would be the infantry version of Shalinka. And next up would be the gear for the archer version of Shalinka. So Shalinka in her archer class should pretty much have a screen magic bow no matter what. Okay. If you don't have it, once again, I have a set of other gear, but I, once again, just like the infantry class, I don't recommend using Shalinka if you don't have an extreme magic bow in the archer class. So other than the extreme magic bow, you're probably going to have the last rites as the armor, the king's crown as the helmet, and a lone star armlet as her best gear option in this class. The reason why lone star armlet would be her best gear is because Shalinka really has to stay outside of other characters' uh, guard range, right? So in that sense, you should always be benefiting from the Lone Star Armlet as a result, because she should almost never be inside the guard range of an ally. So that's why the Lone Star Armlet is her best accessory. Okay. Secondary gear pretty much replaces the King's Crown and the Lone Star Armlet with German Gandir's Eye and Slayer's Emblem, respectively, right? So this would give you even even more damage against flyers, if you will, to guarantee that you can kill them off in one shot. And finally, the other gear section just has me, this is just a set of whatever gear, you know, what I feel is more common. And what's noteworthy about her other set of gear is every single piece of equipment in this other set increases defense, okay? The Bloody Melody provides 5% defense, the Gargoyle Jacket and Loki's Mask increase defense by 15% each, and the Wing Shin Guard increases defense by 10%. So in total, you're looking at a 45% defense increase from all of the, these pieces of gear. So if you have good defense or good defense enchants, let's say, uh, defense percentage enchants, plus the 45% defense, you might be able to be surprisingly tanky against physical strikes. So last but not least, I'm going to talk about the class mastery enchants for Shalinka. So Shalinka pretty much should be focused on, in my opinion anyways, on full offense. So there's going to be attack increases for every single slot, including arena, right? Skill increases in weapon, accessory, and the arena slot will provide a good amount of skill increase overall. For example, if you, maxim if you get a maximum weapon and accessory enchant of skill, you can get plus 40 skill right there, right? By comparison, the armor and headgear slot gives five each. So you only get 10 additional skill enchant from those two. So it's not worth it. So for those two slots, rather than enchanting for skill, you would be better off enchanting for defense. Because I think you can get something like 25 defense in the armor slot, and I think 15 defense in the headgear slot for another 40 defense there. And then finally, the last slot for the weapon and accessory slot, you can do hit points or defense. You know, Here I did hit points on one and then defense on the accessory slot because that the accessory slot can get plus 10 defense. Other than that, the arena slot focus on maximum attack increase. So there's attack increasing, skill increase, a crit chance increase, and a crit damage increase. This is optional. You can choose to replace the crit chance increase with let's say a defense increase to further increase Shalinka's defense, and then the last slot should be defense. So those would be her class mastery enchants. 
And at this point, I'm going to move on to those example battles. So the first example will be a video of clips by a Chinese strategist squad member. So here, Shilinka teleports forward and gets melee attacked by an Ares. And because this Shilinka is bow class with extreme magic bow, Ares is killed along with Shilinka. Now that one is slightly iffy in my opinion because I almost have to wonder if that Ares has last night's room. Moving on, here is a second example. And we see Shilinka hanging in the back. And after Rin uses his AOE, she teleports herself forward initially into the sky towers. Act again is then used on Shilinka. Various actions being taken place, and at this point, Shilinka is now ready to attack. So Shilinka charges in, targets Deedlet, gets to ignore the soldiers, since Deedlet is next to other characters, and gets absolutely crushed. In this example, once again, Shilinka teleports herself forward. The enemy uses Wilder to activate high sticks. And at this point, Shilinka charges even further forward, targets Veen, and very barely killed Reen with the Firebrand snipers. So this next example has Shilinka teleport forward to engage against the enemies who are quite spread out. Right. Bozo's in the bottom and they now teleport Claret a bit so that she can't get her soldiers ignored. Well, instead, Shilinka first targets Bozo and manages to kill him off and then gets to act again because that was his 3C skill. So after the 3C skill, ignore guard attack is used to take down Claret. Now, this one was a little bit iffy as well, because Bozo very barely died there. Bozo had sorceresses and barely died. If Bozo had something like, you know, Swordsmith Metal, he definitely would not have died there. Nonetheless, Luna then attacks Shilinka, and Shilinka being Archer class absolutely kills Luna. So what we got to see overall is that this Archer Shilinka is completely a character who is meant to target and kill flyers. It can also go after low defense characters like potentially Bozo, Reen, and so on. So it's a very specialized role, but against those specific targets, she is very, very deadly. So this next battle will show an infantry Shilinka. And what's noteworthy about this battle is that Shilinka is not running Flash, but instead she is running her mirror skill that allows her to do fixed damage to the enemy and heal up a bit. And player 2 has teleported Leonhardt forward, so let's see what happens here. So player 2 now has Liana to use Act Again on Ashram to send him forward, where he now tosses out an AoE. And it hits both Joshua and Shilinka. So player 1 has Yusuke attack Leonhard, and Leonhard completely barely survives that strike, but he does live, which allows him to do his double AoE. And he starts with Emperor Dark Fusion Sword, right? Dispels a whole bunch of buffs, Sword Breath, and then gets to act again. And then the second attack he uses to finish off Yusuke. And then Reaper's Breath, all of these enemies. So it looks like player one is already behind. Tiaris casts Miracle to heal up the characters as best as she can, but Ashram gets to move in and takes out Joshua. So now it's 3 against 5. Zerida does wipe out Leonhard though, so it does, if you will, begin the comeback. Now Olivier starts moving up and tosses out yet another AoE. This one hits Shalinka and Tiaris, but neither of them fall. 
and then Shalinka, who is heavily damaged, launches her 3C at Ashram, doing some damage and healing light and the 3C heal her up quite a bit. So player 2 who overextended is trying to catch up with all his other characters at this point. So Tiaris heals and Ashram goes after Tiaris. Right? And due to having those bolt rangers, Tiaris completely absorbs that hit from Ashram. Shalinka then targets Olivier and is able to take him down. And Shalinka healed up a bit from that mirror skill. Estelle comes charging in, launches out an AoE attack, but Lancer against infantry means that Shalinka totally absorbs that hit. Tiaris gets more damage though. Zerda tries to attack Ashram and takes him down, but he does revive. And now it's the next turn, turn number four. Tiaris self heals again, provides healing light to Shalinka, and Zerda dies to Ashram because Ashram gets to attack first. Right? So basically, Zerda never got to do any damage to Ashram at all. And then Shalinka easily finishes off Estelle. So now it's two against two. Tiaris and Shalinka against Ashram and Liana. And I'm just gonna end the video here because the battle just devolves into a fight between Ashram and Shalinka, both attacking the healers, and eventually Shalinka, who gets to attack first, finishes off Ashram. What is really noteworthy about this fight was how by bringing the mirror skill, Shilinka was able to keep healing up properly and survive all sorts of AoE attacks and eventually pull off a counter attack. So for this next battle, player 1 has Juggler, Ares, Yusuke, Iris, and Liana. And Ares has been teleported forward by Iris, giving him extra damage for his next AoE attack. Meanwhile, player 2 has a no tank strategy again with Yusuke, Zerda, Shilinka, Didlet, and Tiaris. So now the battle continues. Player 2 begins with Miracle to buff up all of his characters as well. And now Ares gets to charge forward, use his 3C, and then launch a single target strike to wipe out Yusuke. And then do some AoE damage and teleport the other characters to surround him. Then he gets to retreat a little bit, and the follow-up attack, which will be from Deedlit, will crush Ares. So with Ares dead, Yusuke starts activating all of his buffs for player 1. And now the battle gets to continue, where Act Again is used on Yusuke to allow him to start moving forward and trigger his Psychic Eruption skill. So far it's been a trade of Ares for Yusuke, but player 2 still has his tank with 2 healers and Yusuke as a damage dealer. So player 2 retreats Deedlet, waiting for her talent to activate so she can move twice. Player 1 teleports Juggler forward with Sacred Beast him and does damage to both Zerida and Shilinka. So now Zerida moves back so that she can trigger her hide and seek again. And Yusuke comes up and kills Shalinka for the first time. So Shalinka triggers her rest state. Tiaris now casts Attack Blessing on Zerida so that she can do maximum damage for her follow up attack. And two healers just approach. Zerida now charges forward and takes down Yusuke very quickly. He retreats back a little. Beast Shock is now used by Juggler to take out Zerida. Which was a very questionable choice, I feel. He probably would have been better off taking out Shalinka, I feel. In any case, Deedlet gets to act and attacks Juggler but doesn't kill off Juggler because Juggler is just so ridiculously tough and Juggler now gets sealed up. But at the end of the day, the battle is now basically over and player 2 has won because player 1 only has 2 healers with Juggler 
who has already used B-Shock, whereas player 2 has D-Blit and Shlinka as damage dealers, and Tieris as the healer. Keep in mind that Juggler can't even guard against D-Blit's attacks at this point, so it's very easy for Shalinka and D-Blit to wipe out healers and then wipe out Juggler after that. So there you have it. So an example of the Archer version of Shalinka and then some examples of a Swordsman version of Shalinka. And the most unique thing about the Swordsman version is that in these cases, the player didn't even bother running flash, right? He just relied on tanking hits and counterattacking and healing up Shalinka to win. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you found these videos useful to you. And on that note, Nitro out.